Hello, I'm Paul Lambus and welcome to our ninth episode of CultureScope featured on Cypress Mail's interactive web portal Good Living. Our location for this episode is the renowned Coral Beach Hotel and Resort. Standing in Bayside Gardens on the periphery of the Akamas Peninsula, this large contemporary family resort is one to admire. With a plethora of amenities and super guest accommodation, this five-star oasis is a perennial favourite. White walls bathed in sunlight, green gardens dotted with tropical plants and flowers, shimmering pools and sparkling sea views. The Coral Beach Hotel and Resort immerses you in luxury and the authenticity of Bafos, complete with a dose of serenity you would expect from Cyprus's cosmopolitan town. There is so much to discover indoors, not least all the indulgent treatments available at the spa or the well-equipped fitness centre and indoor swimming pool. From stunning rooms and suites with sublime sea views, to magical dining venues serving Mediterranean classics made from market fresh ingredients, the Coral Beach Hotel and Resort is distinguished as the ultimate destination for a luxurious escape immersed in relaxation and rejuvenation. The Cyprus Youth Symphony Orchestra has evolved rapidly during the new millennium into a modern dynamic orchestra with a strong presence in the musical life on the island. At the same time, it is a national symbol representing Cyprus in Europe and beyond. Dr. Kunduris, as an artistic director and conductor of the Cyprus Youth Symphony Orchestra, how has your collaboration with world-renowned orchestras in Europe, Russia and the United States influenced your leadership of the organization? The ecosystem of a symphony orchestra is uh, very similar regardless of the location of its existence. It works the same way in Russia, in the United States and in Germany. Of course, there are local uh, differentiations uh, regarding uh, especially the way uh, the rehearsals are being uh, carried. Uh, but and nevertheless, the idea of having an, an international experience of uh, how people behave uh, uh, in regards to music production personally helped me a lot. And uh, when I began to work with the youth, I have to admit that was much more difficult for me than with professionals. With professionals, you can get away with murder. But with the youth, you have to teach everything from zero. The Cyprus Youth Symphony Orchestra is ranked amongst the top European youth orchestras and is the country's leading music ensemble. What was the inspiration behind these musicians coming together? The idea of uh, creating a system of, which would support the symphonic music in Cyprus was set about 30 years ago in Cyprus with the creation of the uh, State Cyprus Symphony Orchestra and the State Cyprus Youth Symphony Orchestra. Uh, at that time, uh, young talented musicians had the opportunity to meet once a week and play all together and socialize in a music ensemble. Now, in the recent seven or eight years, uh, we invested in the development of that system and uh, we worked into a more sophisticated system that uh, included an academy within the orchestra, uh, junior ensembles and of course the whole symphonic uh, youth ensemble. That way we also understood that our role is to set the standards and to set an example for all other music uh, institutions in Cyprus and to provide uh, the frames that would welcome not only the children that uh, enroll their, themselves in our academy, but also in other state or non-state programs. Cyprus Youth Symphony Orchestra is indeed the leading uh, music education organization of the country 
and I'm also very happy to say that it's perhaps, uh, perhaps the only institution, the cultural institution in Cyprus that enjoys full attendance in all its activities and its concerts. People come there not just to see their children or their grandsons or their relatives, they come to see how these children can play Beethoven V or how can they play an opera, how can they play Stravinsky. Also the fact that the orchestra in the recent years travels abroad and especially gives a concert every year in Vienna has helped into make, making this orchestra very popular and uh, has given the people to, the opportunity to come into theatres and enjoy music. It's very important for the young people to work with their skills and not to be only known for their skills, to be a good physical, good mathematics, to be and for his techniques. Υπάρχει στον ιδιωτικό τομέα που μπορούν να μάθουν μουσική ή να πάνε να κάνουν μαθήματα θεάτρου, αλλά για το πλατή κοινό και τον κοινό θνητό ε, κοστίζουν αυτά. Και καλό ήταν και προτροπή μου και προς το Υπουργείο Παιδείας να ξανασκεφτούν πολύ σοβαρά ότι αυτά τα μαθήματα της τέχνης γενικά, όχι μόνο της μουσικής, να μεταβερθούν ξανά πίσω οι ώρες στα, στα σχολεία για να καταστήσουμε καλύτερους πολίτες. Η τέχνη μορφώνει, κάνει καλύτερο τον άνθρωπο, γίνεται πιο ανθρωπιστής, αγαπάει τη φύση, αγαπάει τα ζώα, ε, αγαπάει τη ζωή. Αυτό είναι πολύ σημαντικό και στις τέχνες η τέχνη αυτό εξυπηρετεί βασικά, να μας κάνει καλύτερους ανθρώπους. Η ορχήστρα νέων ε, εξυπηρετεί αυτό το σημείο, αλλά δεν φτάνει μόνο η ορχήστρα νέων, πρέπει να μπει και στα σχολεία τα δημόσια. Κέρεθ, what is the aim of the Synthopedia program? The Symphopedia program has been running for a few years now, very successfully. It has been specially designed after lots of artistic research. Um, we studied all different programs from around the world. The beauty of the Symphopedia program is that it's not only about playing your instrument. We have a choir, so the children are learning how to, how to sing and communicate with their voices. We've got their instrumental ensembles, for instance I coach the brass ensemble and then they have their rhythm, rhythm class which is with Natasha and that's where they learn their basic rhythms. So it's been designed to give an all-round music education from a very young age. The most important thing is that it, uh, it teaches them to adapt easily because as a musician we need to adapt in many situations and uh, it, uh, it builds their stamina both uh, physically and mentally. I'm really happy uh, teaching and being part of this uh, um, build-up of culture in the, in the youth orchestra. And it, uh, it keeps changing me. I have to keep improving. I have to keep finding new ways to adapt according to the students I have in front of me. I want to always get the best result out of them. Besides, let's say, creating culture and teaching kids how to perform and all these basic things for music. Uh, it's amazing that you reach the point that you teach them how to be culturally intelligent. Since I started working exclusively for the youth orchestra, it has given me a great energy because children, and especially our children that are really, really talented, they, they, they offer um, great energy to me and they push me and urge me to work with more passion every time. And uh, it's important for, for the people, for our people in Cyprus, but also abroad, to, to be aware that we do have talented children who play fantastic music, and we should all uh, support them. However, I have to say that I'm not alone. I have a great colleague, Def Kroskzidas, who is my teammate, and we work together uh, for the youth orchestra. And, um, I'm very, very glad and fortunate to be working with both Def Cross and our artistic director, Mr. Kunduris. The children that enroll in the programs of the Cyprus Youth Symphony Orchestra, they don't just play in the orchestra. They take lessons in our academy, private lessons. They play in chamber groups, they play in junior ensembles, and of course, at the end, they also participate in the symphonic group. I'm very happy to say that in the past years, we have 100% success in regards to our graduates who are successfully enrolled in top universities abroad. 
With an aesthetic, deep-rooted, artistic sensibility towards the creative arts, Nicolas Lavomatos is one of Cyprus's most prolific contemporary artists and a major force on the international art scene. Nicola, when did you decide it was time to quit your job and pursue your dreams? In 2016, the company was in the company of the έβγαζα ένα σχέδιο θελοντικής αφιπηρέτησης, εθελούσιας θελοντικής αφιπηρέτησης. Οπότε εγώ σκέφτηκα ότι ήταν η ευκαιρία να αρπάξω για τον λόγο ότι πάντα ονειρευόμουν να κάνω το χόπι μου επάγγελμα. Οπότε ναι, σκέφτηκα ότι ήταν η καλύτερη ευκαιρία να, να την αρπάξω διότι δεν θα έβρισκα άλλη δεύτερη. Ε, ήρθαν όλα πολύ καλά. Πολύ καλύτερα από ό,τι τα περίμενα, με την, με την ιδέα ότι ο, ο κόσμος ήρθε και αγκάλιασε τη δουλειά μου ε, πολύ περισσότερο. Ε, αν, αν, αν μπορούσα να το πω χαριτολογώντας, έλεγα ναι, έχω regret που δεν το έκανα πιο γρήγορα. When did your passion for art begin? Το πάθος μου για την τέχνη ξεκίνησε εξ όσου θυμάμαι από πολύ μικρή ηλικία. Επειδή εντάξει, μεγάλωσα σε ένα περιβάλλον εντελώ καλλιτεχνικό με τον πατέρα μου, τον Ανδρέα τον Λαδόματο, δεν είχα και πολλέ εναλλακτικέ λύσει να μην ασχοληθώ με την τέχνη, διότι ζώντα και μεγαλώνοντα σε ένα περιβάλλον έτσι, περιτριγυρίζεσαι από την τέχνη. Όπου πήγαινε ο πατέρα μου, με κουβαλούσε μαζί του και έθελα να τον ακολουθώ, διότι ένιωθα ότι κερδίζω. Από μικρό ε, θυμούμαι που με έπαιρνε. Όταν ζωγράφιζε μια σειρά παλιάντες πέτρες στα νερά, πηγαίναμε στα γιοφύρια, έστεινε το καναβάτσο, του ζωγράφιζε. Ήμουνα εγώ δίπλα του, εγώ δίπλα έριχνα πέτρες στους ποταμούς. Ε, ή που ζωγράφιζε την παλιά Λευκοσία, εγώ ήμουν ακόμα παιδάκι, ε, 6-7 χρονών με τα μπαλκόνια που ζωγράφιζε. Οπότε είχα, ό, είχα όλων αυτήν την παιδεία από πολύ μικρή ηλικία, ε, μεγαλώνοντα για να ασχοληθώ και να αγαπήσω την τέχνη μεγαλώνοντας δίπλα σε έναν άνθρωπο όπως ήταν ο πατέρας μου. Και μετά εξελίχθηκε ε, αυτόν το πάθος έτσι, με, την, ε, με την αγάπη μου προς την ε, ζωγραφική, ε, με την ιδέα ότι έβλεπα και εγώ συνέχεια καινούργιε επιδράσεις στον κόσμο της τέχνης, ε, οι οποίες συνεχώς με δίνουν καινούργια φαρτήρια για να ε, ξεκινήσω και να αρχίσω να ψάχνουμε και περισσότερο ω ε, καλλιτέχνη. Η τέχνη η οποία δημιουργώ θεωρώ ότι ανήκει στο πεδίο της σύγχρονης τέχνης, contemporary art. Ξεκίνησα βασικά τις πρώτες μου σοβαρές δημιουργίες το 2001-2002 με τα πρώτα μου κομμάτια τα οποία είχαν έναν πολύ χαρακτήρα γεωμετρικό. How do you perceive the evolution of the art industry in Cyprus? Βλέπω ότι υπάρχει πολύ μεγάλη εξέλιξη στην Κύπρο με το θέμα των τεχνών. Ο κόσμος άρχισε να χτιμά, αγαπά, αντιλαμβάνεται περισσότερο τις τέχνες. Ιδίως η νέα γενιά η οποία έχει βγει εκτός Κύπρου, έχει ταξιδέψει, έχει δει, έχει χορτάσει ας πούμε και αισθητικά αλλά και ποιοτικά τέχνη μέσω από διάφορες εκθέσεις ή γκαλερί ή και μουσεία τέλος πάντων. Να χτίσει μια βάση για συλλέχτες είναι πολύ μεγαλεπίβολο σχέδιο. Αν θέλεις να το πούμε διαφορετικά είναι το όνειρο κάθε καλλιτέχνη. Ε, και ιδίως αυτή η βάση των καλλιτεχνών να μην στηρίζεται μόνο σε οικογένεια ή φίλου. Αυτή είναι η πρώτη που θα σε στηρίξουν όταν κάνεις τα πρώτα σου να πούμε νηπιακά βήματα στον, στον χώρο της τέχνης. Τη δουλειά μου δεν θέλω να την αφήσω μόνο πάνω στην επιφάνεια το 2D στους στίχους και ήθελα να τη δώσω μια άλλη δυναμική για να μπω σε διάφορους χώρους. Το έκανα συνειδητά για να μπορέσω να αυξήσω ας πούμε και τον κύκλο εργασιών μου. Έλεγα ότι το μότο μου είναι κάνε τώρα αυτό που μπορείς να κάνεις διότι μετά μπορεί να μην καταφέρεις να το κάνεις. Όταν νιώσουμε μέσα μας αυτή την, την ανάγκη να κάνουμε κάτι 
Ε, πρέπει να μην το καταπιέζουμε, θεωρώ. Πρέπει, πρέπει να το κάνουμε, διότι η ζωή είναι πάρα πολύ μικρή. Δεν πρέπει να χάνουμε οποιασδήποτε ευκαιρίε μα δίνονται ή να ξυπνήσει μια, μια σπίθα μέσα μα. Πρέπει να την αφήσουμε να γίνει φωτιά, να μην την αφήσουμε, να μην την πνίξουμε. Γι' αυτό θεωρώ ότι είναι πολύ σημαντικό. Poignant, passionate, seductive and controversial, Melina Mercuri was a political activist who sought to symbolize the soul of Greek national identity. Marking 100 years since her birth, Melina Mercuri's international acting achievements on stage and screen and her zestful commitment to Greek art and politics defined her as Greece's most celebrated national hero. Born into a prominent Athenian family on the 18th of October 1920, Melina Mercuri seemed destined to go into politics like her grandfather who had been mayor of Athens. This would prove to be the case, but it took over four decades before she became actively involved in politics, playing a leading role in the struggle against the junta that took control of Greece in 1967. Before this political epiphany, Melina was one of Greece's most celebrated actors. I'm very fond of you. Try it again. The marriage will not take place. What marriage? What the devil are you talking about? The marriage between Ersi and Alexis. And how do you propose to get into a museum without touching the floor? Well, I wouldn't have to touch the floor, would I, if I were to fly? It isn't how I see you, Mr. Page. Mercury's film career took off in the late 1950s and she found international acclaim in the role of Ilya in the Oscar-nominated Never on Sunday, winning the Best Actress Award at Cannes in 1960. She reprised the role in the 1967 stage version on Broadway. It was during this theatre run in New York on April 21st that a group of right-wing army officers seized power in Greece in a coup d'etat. The shame of the colonel who wifely buried democracy, freedom and dignity in Greece. I call upon the United States to respond to this fascism for what it is. Long live democracy, long live democracy everywhere. Boycott the junta! Isolate the junta! Give them hell! Mercury soon became one of the most prominent leaders of the expatriate movement to overthrow the junta and had a Greek citizenship revoked as a result. I am born Greek and I will die Greek. Nobody can take me, my citizen, to be Greek. Uh, Mr. Patakos and the four colonels are born fascist and they will die fascist. Throughout the Junta's seven-year rule, Melina traveled extensively to campaign against the dictatorship, spreading awareness about the situation in Greece and calling for the isolation and removal of the colonels. This outspoken opposition led to an assassination attempt, but Mercuri remained undeterred and continued campaigning against the junta until it fell in 1974. Mercury became Greece's longest serving Minister of Culture and in her role as a champion of Greek and European culture she had many achievements. She launched the campaign for the return of the Parthenon marbles on display in the British Museum and unsurprisingly she actively championed Greek theatre and cinema. One of her greatest achievements was the establishment of the European capitals of culture with Athens chosen as the first capital in 1985. Mercuri continued to act on stage in the early 1990s while remaining as a member of parliament where she focused on establishing links between culture and education at all levels.
Melina Mitguri died on the 6th of March 1994. She left behind her her husband, the film director Jules Dassin, with whom she worked regularly throughout her acting career. Born and raised in London, Christos Tutin has been at the forefront of Nepomak, spearheading the strategic oversight, financial management and external communications in its eight different branches around the world. How did you get involved in uh, Nepomak and how important is it for young overseas Cypriots to get involved? I got involved back in 2014. Um, I accompanied my Bapu to an anti-occupation event in the Houses of Parliament that the National Federation of Cypriots had organised. And while I was there, I met Antonia Michaelides, who was the president at the time, and she just gave me a push and encouraged me to get involved and told me all about it. I went on NDCP, which is Neville Max flagship trip, and I also joined the local committee and just got more and more involved ever since then. The National Federation of Cypriots in the UK is a symbol of unity, obviously, working with all the political parties uh, to coordinate the activities of the UK Cypriot community. Uh, when was the organisation first established and what are the Federation's primary objectives? The National Federation of Cypriots in the UK was founded almost immediately after Turkey's invasion in 1974. Okay. Uh, it was because um, a bunch of Cypriot organisations came together and decided that they needed one common voice, um, united voice, to spearhead and coordinate the UK Cypriot community's campaign for the end of Turkey's occupation. So it was very much a realisation that rather than having lots of different organisations trying to campaign for the end of Turkey's occupation, they should come together um, and have a joint approach and be united, like you said, a symbol of unity, that everyone's pulling in the same direction. The key thing for the Federation has been to constantly keep the message and the campaign for a free United Cyprus alive in the UK and particularly amongst British parliamentarians. One of the big successes of the organisation has been to keep that at the forefront of, of many MPs and government ministers' minds. Um, and we've done that in a few different ways. So traditionally it would be um, based on developing strong relations with politicians and the government. Yeah. Um, but more recently we've introduced kind of e-campaigning and, and taken a much more grassroots approach um, as well as the more traditional meetings and um, kind of traditional relationships with politicians. So some of the e-campaigns have been um, about Turkey's actions in the Eastern Mediterranean. So back in 2018 when it, when it was a newish issue, we encouraged the community here in the UK to send emails to the, the Foreign Secretary. And we sent so many emails in the space of two weeks that it actually became the biggest foreign policy issue in terms of correspondence in the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Well, um, we created a lot of noise and also uh, drove uh, an improved statement and position from the then Minister for Europe. So that was a, a big success and um, we were proud of that. And kind of since then, we've also um, done another e-campaign, which has been to encourage uh, people up and down the UK to email their local politician about the Cyprus issue and we actually through that managed to reach over half of the total MPs in the country. Every year there's the Conference of Overseas Cypriots where the different federations across the world come together right. and part of that meeting is to discuss, coordinate, um, share best practices on what's worked and haven't worked in our different um, regional association. Each country has its own unique um, position and um, situation politically and so part of, part of our job is to kind of figure that out and work out what's going to work best. I think that there's, there's a real strong passion for justice, for reunification, for the end of the Turkish occupation amongst young diaspora Cypriots. I think Part of what we do as Nebelmatch is to educate people on the, on 
the invasion, the occupation, the consequences that were felt back in 1974 and the consequences that are still felt today. And I think that, so that definitely burns deeply amongst young diaspora Cypriots and there's real passion there. Um, and obviously we, we acknowledge, we know that many of our members are descendants of people who had to leave Kyrenia, Famagusta, where, wherever they live that's now occupied as refugees. And that isn't something that forgotten and lost in, in the space of a few generations. If your great-grandfather fled in 1974, you, it's something that, that sticks with you. you, you you're aware of that and, and Correct. you're passionate about that. So, so, so young diaspora Cypriots are definitely just as passionate um, about that. And, and, and like I said, our role as a youth organization that is trying to get those people to become involved in the organized community is to educate, um, inspire, uh, kind of help people grow into community leaders that will take on these issues from our parents and grandparents in the years to come. Your grandfather was extremely active in helping his fellow Cypriots and also trying to solve the Cyprus problem in his own way. Did his achievements inspire you in some way to follow in his footsteps? Definitely. I mean, he's he's been a he's been a massive influence me on me since I was a child. Um, just as a kind of background, he he was the manager of the Cypriot Community Centre in London for over thirty years. Um, he was also been uh, vice president of BOMAC for many years um, and the National Federation too. So growing up, um, he was someone that I admired and looked up to, still do. Um, yes. And his his contribution to the community has been has been enormous. And that that really inspired me and made me realise what can be done and and what every young diaspora Cypriot should aspire to. Yota Ioannidou is a buffer space sculptor and a great advocate of the town. A great believer in public art, her renowned sculptures have become iconic monuments, revealing subtle nuances about the city and providing a better understanding about our island's history and culture. Έχεις ανάγκη από αυτή την τρελή αυτοπεποίθηση η οποία χρειάζεται που νομίζεις ότι μπορείς να κάνεις τον καλλιτέχνη. Όταν ξαφνικά καταλαβαίνεις τη δυσκολία του πράγματος και όταν πραγματικά αρχίζεις να κάνεις έργα, πραγματικά έργα, τότε εσύ εκείνη τη στιγμή μικραίνεις. Ε, αρχίζεις να χάνεις ο ίδιος τη σημασία σου μπροστά στα έργα σου τότε συνειδητοποιείς ότι κάτι έκανες ότι το έργο σου γίνεται πιο σημαντικό από σένα Θα έλεγα ότι η έμπνευση η φάση της έμπνευσης αν θέλετε είναι η αγωνία μου να μην εξαφανιστώ από την ίδια τη δύναμη του τοπίου αλλά ούτε και το έργο μου να γίνει ανταγωνιστικό, αλλά μέρος του. Ο δημόσιος χώρος πάντα σου παίρνει πολύ χρόνο. Όταν συνήθως κάνω ένα με δύο μεγάλα έργα το χρόνο, μου παίρνουν όλη την ενέργεια. Έτσι δεν κάνω μελλοντικά σχέδια. Ζω αυτό που έχω απέναντί μου. Ζω τη στιγμή. Stay connected and follow us on social media. If you want to be featured on CultureScope, contact our production team on the email provided below. Until next time, stay safe and let culture transform your life.